But right now, Jerry, they're fighting for an NCAA tournament berth. But fighting might not be the right word used after what we saw yesterday. But, Jerry, they're, they're one of your first four teams out of the field. Yeah, well, Michigan's biggest problem right now is their record just isn't good enough. And then they haven't done enough to overcome a, a record of 14 and 11. And when you go back, oh, what, 26 pre-pandemic tournaments, as long as I've been tracking this, only one team got an at-large bid that wasn't at least four games above 500. And that was uh, Georgia in 2001 that played a schedule that nobody can touch. So, you know, while that's not specifically criteria, history does not bode well for Michigan here. They're going to need a strong finish down the stretch of this season, whether Jawan Howard is coaching the team or not, and whether any players get suspended or not, they're still going to have to finish strong if they're going to make a case to get into the NCAA tournament. They do have a strong net ranking of 34, which is uh, interesting when you when you factor in uh, Rutgers' net ranking of 80. But Rutgers, a bunch of good wins lately. Those two teams face off Wednesday in a huge game on the bubble. Over in the ACC, North Carolina, one of those first four teams out of the tournament. They're facing a must-win tonight against Louisville, Jerry. What does North Carolina have to do to have a realistic shot down the stretch? Yeah, North Carolina's resume is really soft. They've lost every game they've played against anyone with a shot at the NCAA tournament, or at least anyone in the bracket. Now, they did beat Michigan. That's their best win uh, in terms of bracket contenders, really their only win. Uh, but they also have that quad four loss to Pittsburgh. And before that, the best thing you could say about North Carolina's tournament resume was at least they don't have any bad losses. Well, now they have a bad loss and very few opportunities to build positive things on that side of their resume because the ACC is so far down. So playing Louisville doesn't help them. It can only hurt them. That end of season game at Duke is their one remaining regular season chance to make a positive impression on this selection committee. Otherwise, they're just going to have to wait for the conference tournament. Yeah, this is something of a, of a flashback to a year ago when it was Duke. Remember, Duke, a year ago, we were talking about would they, would they not get in. In addition to Kentucky, it was a bizarre year because it was COVID, but a lot of blue bloods were weirdly not where they normally are when we get to this point in the season. And now it's North Carolina. North Carolina right now has two combined games versus a quad one or quad two opponent left in the regular season. Obviously, the ACC tournament, once that begins, will give Carolina more opportunities there. But it's going to, what do you want? Like, it's going to have to win and win a ton. And I don't know, just from a pure evaluation standpoint of this team, I actually think the roster is capable of getting a win or two in the NCAA tournament, even though they lack they lack the wins against the teams. I get that. I'm just saying, I, I actually have faith in UNC. If it were to get in, being that first four team that goes to Dayton, winning that game and maybe picking off an upset in the first round, I think they've got the potential to do that. But, man, they're going to be one of the most compelling teams once we get to the conference tournaments because quite clearly, as Jerry just laid out, they, they're they going to have to go deep into that bracket to give themselves even a halfway comfortable chance at hoping to get into the field. Hard to believe that an ACC team like North Carolina could go maybe 14-6, and 13-7 and seven in the ACC and be a bubble team. That conference uh, has really weakened over the last several years. Another bubble team in action tonight over in the Big Ten, Indiana currently on Jerry's 11 line, facing Ohio State. And, Matt, the Hoosiers have lost four straight games. What has happened to the Hoosiers? Well, they definitely have lost their way a little bit overall. Mike Woodson prides himself on how uh, stout defensively he is as a coach. And Indiana certainly had a certain toughness and reliability earlier in the season versus what we've seen now. This is a big-time game. It's actually big for both teams because Ohio State's had its own stumbles as of late. You know, was a team that was just narrowly on the outside of the top 16 going in. At least Tom Burnett said Ohio State was in contention to be on the four line in advance of that bracket reveal didn't make it, then proceeds to go on and lose at home to Iowa in not close fashion over the weekend there. So Indiana's the more uh, noteworthy team because its position as it, in terms of making the tournament is more vulnerable. But I actually find this particular game to be fairly urgent for both teams because Ohio State, which has gotten such a good season out of EJ Liddell, I would have him as a first-team All-American right now. Uh, we find some unexpected urgency Jerry, with both of these teams at this point in the year, uh, quite clearly both these fan bases, I thought the Ohio State fans probably thought they'd be a little better than what they are now. And clearly, I think Indiana fans didn't expect them to kind of look up at, in late February and think, all right, is there actually a possibility we could play ourselves out of the field? 
Yeah, well, there's urgency, I suppose, but for different reasons, because Ohio State is playing for seed and Indiana is playing for selection. And for Indiana, their problem is their schedule isn't very good, led by a really bad non-conference schedule. But the, the nice thing for Indiana is they don't have a bad loss, uh, but they don't have enough really good wins. But they did beat Purdue at home. They did beat Ohio State at home. So they're actually looking for a season sweep of the Buckeyes in this game. They have a neutral court win over Notre Dame, or at least as neutral as Indianapolis gets for IU. And that's three wins over teams that are currently in the bracket and likely to stay in the bracket. And we just got done talking about North Carolina having zero of those games. So that's kind of why Indiana's in and near the bottom of the bracket and North Carolina is still out, is that Indiana has found a way to pick up at least a couple quality wins, uh, albeit on their home floor, and has avoided the kinds of losses that really push you down the bracket. And it's going to be really important. If they can win at Ohio State, that gives them a little bit of a cushion going into the end of this regular season. Their last game is at Mackey against Purdue. So, you know, they've got to take advantage of chances like this when they get them. Six and a half point underdogs tonight are the Hoosiers at Ohio State. Over the weekend, we had the NCAA reveal their top 16 seeds. Big 12 closest to having multiple one seeds. Kansas fourth overall, Baylor fifth. Bears in action tonight at Oklahoma State before they match up with the Jayhawks Saturday. What's the likelihood, Jerry, the Big 12 can get two number one seeds? Well, there's a chance. Uh, when you've got four and five, you know, at a starting point, then you've always got a chance. Uh, but you, like you said, they play each other again in the regular season. Uh, the, the scenario that gets both of these teams in is that they play each other again at the end of the conference tournament and probably split those games. Well, uh, doesn't really matter how they split them. But then they're going to need help. They're going to need help from uh, Arizona or Auburn or Gonzaga coming back to the pack a little bit. Because as Tom Burnett said, those three teams had kind of separated themselves from number four. There was a little bit of a gap there. Now, Auburn has probably come back a little bit. But if you're going to get both of those teams up on that top line, they're going to have to perform well themselves and get help from most likely Auburn or Arizona. I tell you what, so uh, Baylor being on the five uh, overall mark is interesting there. Baylor's number two in the country in combined quad one, quad two wins, and obviously that is a factor. I just want to interject something real quick with Texas Tech. I don't think Texas Tech can get a one. I think the chances the Big 12 has three teams on the one and two line is very good. Why do I say that? Texas Tech has six wins over teams that were in the top 16 on Saturday. Any other team that was in that grouping, no one had more than three. Now, Texas Tech has six losses. They're all quad one. And if you look at Texas Tech's schedule to close out the Big 12 season, I could easily see them running the table before it gets to the conference tournament. If it does that, I think the Red Raiders would very comfortably project, at least put them in a position to be a two seed. So I don't know about two on the one line. Jerry covered all that. I think there's a very healthy chance that Kansas, Baylor, and Texas Tech on Selection Sunday will be somewhere in that mix of one to eight overall, which means they'd have three of the top eight, top two lines. What a job Mark Adams has done in his first season there as the head coach at Texas Tech. Matt Norlander and Jerry Palm with us here on HQ as Bracketology ramps up with just a couple weeks to go in the regular season. Here are the notable games tonight with Ohio State six and a half point favorites against Indiana. The Hoosiers really, really need this. They are reeling losers of four straight games and on the 11 line, according to Jerry and the Baylor Bears, four and a half point favorites at Oklahoma State as they continue their quest for a one seat. Do you want a sports network that delivers everything that matters about the game? The highlights, the picks, the instant analysis, no yelling, no fake debates, no politics. Hit the subscribe button and never miss a moment.